Hello, everyone. So um, as you've all signed up, you know that this is a webinar about business banking for e-residents. And in particular, uh, it's a deep dive with Estonian banks, LHB and Coop Bank, who happen to be very trusted members on our marketplace. So uh, here are the speakers that will be here with us today. I've got my colleague, Lene. Hi, I'm the head of business development here at the team. And uh, also a former entrepreneur myself, uh, not an e-resident, but a real resident of Estonia. And we've got Kat from LHV. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, presenting here at LHV and the non-resident department. And we also have Marcus from Coop Bank as well. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Marcus and I'm a business client manager at Coop Bank and also the residency field lead, plus entrepreneur a bit myself. So I'm also on the side of uh, business clients. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the agenda for today. First of all, we're going to set the scene. Um, for those of you who might be a bit more new to e-residency, we'll give a very, very, very short intro to what e-residency is and how to start a company in Estonia. And then we'll look at business banking options for e-residents, um, namely the providers that we, um, we recommend on our marketplace. Um, we'll then turn over to the banks who will give you a little bit of a reality check about, uh, particularly about uh, Know Your Client or KYC, due diligence and correspondent relationships. And then each bank will go through their preferred client segments, their eligibility criteria and onboarding processes. And then once we finish the little uh, presentations that we have, we, we will open up to the live Q&A. And I can already see people are putting their questions in there and that's really great to see. So um, as, as we go through the presentations, feel free to add your questions there and we'll, uh, we'll answer them at the end. Um, I can see a few people also raising their hands. Um, we won't, um, uh, because, we, because we only have a very short time today um, and we have a lot of content to get through and a lot of questions to answer, we won't be taking you on live. So please write your questions in the Q&A rather than putting your hand up. And don't write it in the chat either because then it might get lost during all the highs and then the greetings from different places around the world. Exactly. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn over to Ulene to give an intro about your residency now. Yes, yeah, so if uh, by any chance you have joined this webinar by accident, <laughs> you don't actually know what e-residence is, then uh, e-residence is an Estonian governmental startup that provides non-residents with um, digital identification that is acceptable here um, to use Estonian public services. Um, these services mainly include those of, of uh, registering a business in Estonia. Uh, it's a mean of identifying you online. Uh, it's a government issued ID. And uh, as, as an AIDAS uh, approved digital signature, you can use this to actually sign documents. And uh, in theory, they should be valid all across the European Union as well. But also e-residents form a really inspiring community of entrepreneurs who are running cross-border businesses. So, so besides the digital ID and the digital signature and the access to Estonian e-services, you'd be having access to this global community of really inspiring um, entrepreneurs, mainly small and medium-sized entrepreneurs around the world. It's probably also really important to go through what e-residency is not. And the e-residency is not a travel document. Uh, it doesn't even have your picture on it. So it might give you a hint. Um, it's not also a citizenship or a visa or a residency permit to the actual country of Estonia. Uh, it's only a digital access. Um, it doesn't automatically translate into tax residency because international tax is a whole other topic and, and it's not the, it doesn't come automatically with the residency card or an Estonian company. And also you cannot uh, count on it to translate directly into getting a business bank account or a personal bank account um, at all. So, so let's see today like what, what the, all you need to get a bank account in Estonia. Opening a company in Estonia... Uh, I can say it from my own experience that it, it is very easy and Estonia is a really simple country to do business in. It's a, it's a transparent and a secure business environment. We rank really high um, on world level in terms of ease of doing business. Um, we like to say that it's, it's very low red tape uh, kind of business environment. Um, as somebody from outside of the EU, you'll have opportunities to scale and grow uh, within the European market. And Estonia also has a really nice tech scene. So if you are a startup founder, you might look into things like the startup ecosystem here. You might look into things like different accelerator programs and also the startup visa, which allows you to physically relocate to Estonia. 
Um, and it is a community of like-minded people, uh, not only Estonian entrepreneurs who have grown 10 unicorn companies out of here, but also the international entrepreneurs who have made Estonia their digital home. When you become an e-resident, then uh, the general process looks like this. Uh, you apply online. Uh, the application process is handled by our police and border guard. Um, the application takes about 30 minutes, and uh, sometimes you'll get some additional questions, sometimes not. Um, but uh, once your application is approved, then uh, the police and border guard will ship your uh, e-residency card to uh, one of the uh, pickup locations around the world that we have. Um, most of them are Estonian embassies you get to go to our embassy i heard from a from a uk uh, e-resident uh, this morning that he was very excited that he could go to the embassy and actually feel like a little bit of part of part of estonia uh, by this um, then the entire process from start to finish should be somewhere between three and eight weeks depending on how far you are away from estonia and how many additional questions you might need to answer in the process but once you have the residency card it is super easy to start a business. Um, and since I've done it many times, um, undercover, I can say that the last one took me about 15 minutes from start to finish to fill out the application on the commercial registry and three and a half hours for the company to be actually live in Estonian business registry. But we're not going to go this extreme. We're just going to say, let's say it takes one to two uh, business days to get your company up and running in Estonia. Uh, and the next uh, step, what we've done from our team side is that we have uh, tried to make it super easy um, as an ecosystem of uh, different service providers for you as a, as a non-resident, somebody from uh, not from Estonia, to understand uh, what to do in Estonia, how to do in Estonia with the help of different service providers. And these include corporate service providers who can help you with accounting, um, legal address, but also banks and fintechs, um, tax advisors, and many more. So uh, definitely go to the residency marketplace and see what you need, what kind of services do you need. Currently, we have uh, 92,000 e-residents from 170 plus countries mm -hmm. um, who have registered 21,000 companies in Estonia. And, and as a small country, last year, Estonia had a total of about 16,000 something companies registered. Over 4,500 of them were uh, registered by e-residents. So just to give you a perspective on this. But obviously, no business can function without the possibility to um, take payments from your customers. Uh, so what kind of options for business banking do e-residents have once they have opened a company in Estonia? Um, by and large, we have three um, main options. So payment institutions and fintechs in the EU. Um, the fintechs are useful because you can open an account entirely online. There's a very wide variety of them. The services um, can go very deeply into like one segment or they can be very broad, um, but they don't provide business loans. So that's one thing that makes them different from the banks in Estonia. And the banks in Estonia open business bank accounts to companies that um, can somehow demonstrate a strong connection to Estonia. And this is why we've uh, organized this Q&A today with LHB and co-op to, to really give you an idea of what this strong connection to Estonia means. A personal visit to the bank is required. Um, so the bank needs to actually really like verify that you are you uh, physically. But a little known fact is that e-residents can also use a bank in other EU or uh, European economic area countries. So something to consider is that if you have a really good uh, bank relationship, let's say in Poland, then uh, you might want to actually turn to your Polish bank and say that you have an entity registered in Estonia for which you would like a bank account in your Polish bank. So it might actually turn out easier. We have made this very nice um, table uh, for you to give an over uh, for, to give you an overview of the different fintechs and banks that we work with as partners through our marketplace. So we have LHE and Co-op joining us today, but besides that, we also work with Wise, Wamo, um, Juni, Payhawk, Paysera, and Integero. And a couple of things to notice about them is that some of them um, some of them are for like everyone. Uh, Wise, for instance, is a is a very easy way to send international payments in various currencies. They will provide you with a Belgian. 
account um, registered like the BE abbreviation, then uh, you might get an Estonian bank account through WAMO and, and Payhawk, for example. Um, Juni is specifically targeting um, e-commerce companies and big media buyers. So it's a, it's kind of a niche uh, company. Uh, if you are an e-commerce store um, advertising a lot um, on Google ads, then you might want to check into uh, what they're doing. Payhawk provides for bigger teams, bigger distributed teams, a very nice way to handle your uh, payments and, uh, and uh, give out different cards to different team members with different limits. Um, and each of them have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, you really have to just kind of like see what the, what the services are about. But today we have here two banks, two Estonian banks that are the, the full stack banks <laughs> that could in theory also provide your growing business once um, a business loan if you need to. Um, and um, you can put the next slide. And why this is important, um, Hannah will tell you a little bit about a survey that we did last year. Um, like why are we even inviting mm -hmm. LHP and co-op here today uh, to give a little bit of background? So e-residency did a survey at the beginning of 2021 in February um, about business banking because we were hearing a lot from um, social media, from our customer support channels and from e-residents in, in, at events and everything that they were having difficulties with business banking. So we did a survey because we wanted to really understand um, and analyse the problems. Um, 1,313 respondents uh, uh, from... Uh, e-residents with companies that was the target that we that we surveyed um, responded to our survey and for out of, out of all of those 46 percent had the perception that Estonian bank accounts were difficult to open we also um, made sure to ask them uh, what sort of accounts they had um, some people had uh, more than one account but in general most people had at least had one um, of, of all the people who answered 66 percent um, were with a fintech like wise or um, I think Intergiro, these kinds of uh, companies uh, 32 percent had an Estonian bank account um, at the time LHV was the only Estonian bank on our marketplace so most of those people were with LHV and then 10% were with um, a European Economic Area Bank from other countries in the, in the EU. Um, none had 7%. And the, and the reasons for these were mixed. Um, mostly it was because they unsuccessfully applied for an account. Um, but some also had had an account that was closed or, um, or hadn't gotten around to opening it or so they didn't need one. Um, we were really actually quite surprised and, and happy that 93% of the respondents did have some form of business banking account. So that was actually a positive thing for us. But we also realised that, like, uh, we needed to improve um, access. Um, and that's why uh, since February last year, we've increased the number of fintechs on our, on our um, marketplace. And we've also increased um, uh, the Estonian banks by including co-op there as well. Um, of those who had opened Estonian bank accounts, 84% um, had opened them on the first attempt uh, and 16% on two or more attempts. And finally, um, we asked them if they had done the opening of the account themselves. We, we thought that this was quite interesting because we do have a marketplace and a lot of service providers offer this service. Um, most of them had opened it um, themselves, but a big, but a big percentage, 43%, had used a service provider. And this is something that we do recommend, especially if you don't know the landscape so well. It is good to sometimes use a local service provider to help with this. So I think with that in mind, um, I'm going to now turn over to, I think, Marcus is first from Co-op Bank. And um, you can uh, just let me know when I need to change the slide, Marcus. Sure. <clears throat> So 46% had the perception that the uh, bank account was difficult to open. <laughs> wow. I actually thought it was much higher. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Um, it's an honest question. Like, uh, why is opening a bank account such a hustle? And uh, why sometimes banks even re reject, you know, possible clients? Um, basically, we need clients, right? We need your we need your deposits. It's our bloodstream, basically. Uh, we are profit oriented, so of course every company bank is basically another company. We need clients, right? And but why would we hire full departments of uh, people to AML, which is anti money laundering, to KYC department? Uh, those those departments essentially bring nothing to the table. 
Let's say they don't sell. <laughs> say no uh, they, they don't. Honestly, yeah, they don't sell anything. Um, more likely, they're gonna take you know pieces away from your plate. So, so but uh, but the thing is that we actually have to know our clients and uh, and why. Well, it's written on the slide already, so you have uh, you have read it. Uh, law requires us to. I, I'm not gonna. Maybe I'm not gonna list all the laws here, but. Uh, the most important one is definitely Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Prevention Act. Uh, there's also definitely, which is a hot topic right now, is uh, being compliant with sanctions. Uh, definitely some Tax Information Exchange Act. And also it's all related to the Credit Institutions Act, Personal Data Protection Act. So um, what kind of information we need to know. Well, I've put like three points here. One is board members and beneficial owners. The board members is obvious uh, because board members are the decision makers. They're the ones who are going to use the account. And uh, beneficial owners, well, we actually need to know the whole structure of the company. I mean, uh, if the company is owned by another company, which is which is owned by another company. Then we need to know the final, final boss, basically the the last uh, you know natural person who's the beneficial beneficial owner who's gonna pocket the money. Uh, the second big part is uh, area of business activities, which is um, in terms of geography and also industry. So in terms of geography, we we need to know. Uh, where your partners are, where your business is conducted, and uh, in terms of industry, well, what kind of business you're doing, basically. And business volumes, mm, in in terms of, yeah, how, how much traffic will there be uh, on your account? If you're a well-established or, you know, already existing and working company, then you already uh, should at least should know how much uh, money will be going, coming and going, uh, onto the account and from the account. Uh, if you are just starting, then you at least can give us some prognosis. And it also uh, considers the cash uh, deposits and cash withdrawals. So um, let's move on to the next slide. And, and also, actually, one thing important to mention, you don't have to go back to the previous slide, but uh, basically, if Banks don't know their clients, and if they don't do their due diligence, uh, there are heavy fines for both legal entity, I mean the bank, but you know, bank doesn't have a nervous system. Uh, you can turn the bank uh, in, in, in the same way you can, uh, I don't know, convict uh, uh, a, an employee of a bank, but uh, yeah, also employees of the bank uh, can be held, uh, you know, accountable if money is being laundered and if they didn't uh, do the due diligence properly. So this is like really important. And uh, yeah, what kind of due diligence measures or in enhanced due diligence me measures do we apply? Um, well, this is something that I get asked quite often, like uh, people are sending me emails. I know that uh, hosts of this webinar also want to uh, want me to answer this question is that um, what kind of documents do I need to provide to get, you know, an account but from if, if I don't know anything about the company, then it's really hard to answer that. So first we need the client data form and then we can actually start applying due diligence measures and decide what we need to know. Let's say, for example, second point on this slide is uh, origin of your assets. Well, if you're, uh, and most of you I know are, uh, let's say digital nomad or um, freelancer or you know a one-man company that uh, for example does some programming or design to uh, tech startups then we don't need to know too much about the uh, origin of your assets since you don't actually Hello. most prob most probably you won't be investing too much money uh, into the company initially. I mean, what what do you need? You need a laptop, uh, maybe a co-working space, uh, not not too much more. So I don't know this two hundred and uh, two thousand and five hundred euros, uh, which is the initial share capital. 
well, if you if you work in tech uh, tech industry, then probably you earned it uh, last last week. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, reaching of assets is definitely important. Let's say when you're going to invest some, let's say, bigger money into the company, hundreds, thousands, maybe. Well, let's say you put like million euros into an account. We need to know. Uh, we need to know where this money comes from. Um, sometimes. Uh, AML or anti-money laundering likes to take it further. They want to determine the origin of wealth, which uh, is not only the specific funds uh, used in a specific uh, transaction, let's say, but uh, also like the like the whole. How did you how did you get basically so much money? So uh, if if you yeah like like I made an example, if you uh, invest 1 million euros while you have 10 million euros on your account, then uh, who said that, uh, you know, where did you get that specific 1 million from? But we need to know the bigger picture. So uh, what can be asked as well is agreement with your partners. Uh, sometimes we just need to make sure that uh, there are agreements with specific partners that you have declared that you're going to do business with. Um, sometimes we actually want to see the content as well. Uh, agreements with partners is important as well because um, because you know there's there has to be this strong connection to the Estonian markets, and sometimes people, you know, uh, they just you know, they they just declare some. Some companies say that they will start working with them, but there's nothing to show for it. Like uh, I, I understand that if you're uh, just starting your startup, you don't even have a bank account yet. It's uh, ag it, it's like really hard to have a proper um, contract with your partners, but you can have some sort of agreement. I mean, uh, probably the companies or your partners are willing to write and and. Um, digitally sign a document which at least uh, states that there's you know a willingness or um, or yeah at least a plan to uh, work with your company uh, we always check your background in terms of um, publicly available information at least uh, sometimes we inquire more uh, ask you more questions previous payment history well especially for established companies we we sometimes ask for, um, let's say, bank statement uh, to determine uh, basically whether uh, to to determine whether the data that you have provided in the client data form is correct, and also how much is the cash volume, like how much cash is deposited and uh, withdrawn, plus. Fact-based assessment of place of business, uh, not used too often, but uh, let's say that you're going to build an, an industry or factory in, in, in Estonia, then uh, sometimes we might just, you know, invite ourselves to your uh, <laughs> to your company and uh, and check that actually, yeah, the business is conducted in that particular place. Yep. Yes, everything Marcus said uh, also applies to LIG, and then um, we basically carry out the same uh, the same kind of entity and uh, in KYC uh, procedures. Uh, but just wanted to jump in quickly and uh, and talk a bit about correspondent banks, correspondent relationships, but also um, kind of add to the context of uh, where where banks operate. So just to quickly give you an overview of um, what are correspondent relationships and why do we need them at all? Where are they so essential to banking in general? Um, a bank, a correspondent bank, why we need them is basically to just carry out cross-border transfers, transactions, all sorts of transactions, be it payments, uh, be it ethic services, uh, buying, selling of shares, bonds, and trade finance services, etc. We need a partner um, abroad to connect us to uh, to other banks whom we do not have a direct uh, connection to. 
for example, if a client of ours wants to wire USD, uh, make an USD payment, we would then need to have a counterparty uh, to facilitate that payment. So someone who would accept the funds of our client and then deliver them to, um, to the recipient's bank account. Um, and then, therefore, uh, there are those correspondent relationships in place. Um, the relationship relies heavily on trust, um, mainly mainly because uh, the correspondent relationships they don't do not really have a very clear visibility. Uh, they would have to just go uh, with the procedures uh, that the um, there's, that we as a bank have, and then uh, just. Uh, have, have faith that we carry out our KYC procedures, our AML procedures, uh, um, as we have declared, as we have promised, and then um, and, and do it properly, because they are also responsible for having their rules and procedures in place, and they're also responsible for, for the payments, for the funds that they, um, they, uh, they process. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is, um, um, this is why uh, they're very conservative to say, um, and that kind of translates to our um, our approach as well. Uh, that that we cannot say we have a higher uh, higher higher risk appetite. We would maybe be on um, maybe be understand um, businesses that are maybe uh, connected to higher risks. But we cannot make those decisions in vacuum and onboard clients without having the permission by our correspondent banks. Losing a correspondent bank relationship, this would basically um, leave a very bad mark to to bank itself. Um, it's um, it might end up um, in in financial damage, reputational damage. Then. Uh, getting new relationships in place, it's not going to happen overnight. It's, uh, it's going to take, it might take years. <laughs> and, uh, and that, um, going back to the, the ex example I had before, um, say we offer USD payments to a client whom our correspondent bank is not comfortable with. They're not simply going to cut down the, the USD payments for that specific client. They're most likely going to cut down uh, this this service for all of our client base. So that would leave us in a very bad uh, position as a bank for not being able to serve our clients the service we have promised them to. Mm. And having a bad reputation, um, having been cut down by a correspondent bank, does not leave us to a very good position to apply for new correspondent relationships. Um, again, coming from the background of uh, the Baltic region, the European, uh, uh, Eastern European background, banks, uh, cor correspondent banks are not very um, open to starting new relationships at all. So uh, this might have a devastating effect on, on the banking um, as a business and whole. And that's why maintaining a good relationship, a good correspondent relationship, is really the backbone of uh, of modern banking in general, and, uh, and something that we would have to take into account the risk appetite of our correspondent bank and their very conservative at approach while onboarding our new new clients, new customers. Just a quick, uh, quick something uh, to add more context. But over to Marcus. Uh, so yeah, customer segments, um, starting with industries, I didn't put anything on the green and the yellow one. Uh, basically, a green one is or should be the ones that are the most easiest to open. Yellow ones, you know, iffy. Red ones, we don't do. I didn't put anything on the green and the yellow because, you know, it's impossible to list every 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 industry there is <laughs> but what we don't do definitely and it comes from our uh, risk appetite as well as Gert just explained what risk appetite is uh, we don't do adult industry um, crypto and weapon industry well there's exception to everything uh, crypto we actually do or, or allow in case you know there that uh, 
your company's main business activity is something else. Let's say that uh, you're the you're the one man company working for different tech companies. Uh, you know, you're a designer or a programmer, engineer there, and some of the income to your company you take out as a salary, and some you actually invest in crypto. And then, then we yeah then then we can actually then we can agree that this is this is fine for our risk appetite as well weapon industry well uh, if the weapons are sold to nato then then this is something that <laughs> can be accepted as well area of business uh, in ge geographical terms when it's you know based in estonia everything is in estonia the workers um or the employees the um, you know, main partners, both buyers and suppliers, everything in Estonia, then usually there isn't much issue if everything else is fine. I mean, if the industry is okay, the backgrounds, everything. Uh, the minimum, you know, volume uh, of uh, connection to Estonia, we like to say, has to be at least 50%. So, like, one part of the supply chain needs to be Estonia, whether it's uh, suppliers or, or, or buyers. Um, the areas that we don't do, actually, the list is a bit longer. Uh, Russia and Belarus are currently tricky, let's say, uh, due to the situation in Ukraine. Uh, then the financial um, action task force blacklist and the uh, Definitely lots of offshore, offshore countries as well uh, are, are, are sketchy uh, by our risk appetite. Residents of beneficial owner, well, uh, definitely most of you don't go to that, uh, to the green one. So you're non-residents as your e-residents, right? And if you're, if you're elsewhere, then uh, if you're on the yellow part, then that means that some due diligence needs to be applied nothing nothing tragic but yeah the aforementioned countries uh, we uh, we at least the new ones new clients from these regions we we currently don't open as the you know we want to be compliant with the sanctions and and all that uh, and under the elsewhere it's much easier if you're from eea country which is a european economic area uh, background of beneficial owner well it has to be logical i would say that if you let's say that you start a company uh, same old one man company uh, in, in it and if you have like a long cv or uh, a long resume in, uh, in in it field then it definitely helps and uh, it's logical that you need that company. If it's unrelated to the industry, then of course we have to look uh, look into it. But uh, if you have been associated with um, organized crime related sources of income, mostly drugs, but also might be human trafficking or are under sanctions, then unfortunately um, we cannot cooperate. Background of the company, well, well established. Uh, that means that the company has been running and working for a while already. Uh, there's like um, a portfolio to show. There's uh, already a payment history. Everything is understandable. It doesn't, it's not only based on the prognosis or the business plan, then it all also helps much. Um, and we don't want to, or Let's say that we can't, we simply don't have the resources to control everything if the uh, structure of the company is um, unreasonably complex. And by structure, I mean the ownership structure, right? So when their company is owned by another legal entity, which is, an, uh, which is owned by another legal entity in a third country and so on. Um, required services, we offer, you know, mostly everyday banking, mm, the regular ones, payments, bank account, deposits, uh, debit card, credit card, uh, business loans, etc. Uh, what we don't do is payment to certain countries. 
uh, four mentioned ones, well, currently Russia and Belarus. Um, actually, the list is like 50 countries long. You can find it on our on our website. Um, also, tax consultancy. Nobody has asked me though, but it's in our risk appetite, so there has to be a good reason. We don't found like we don't establish new companies as well for our, our clients, which I know that a certain bank that I'm not going to name uh, has done. They they lost their license later because uh, companies were often used for money laundering. Um, brokerage uh, services. This is more of LHV's cup of tea. They they do the in investing stuff. You can buy stock um, there, but unfortunately not with us yet. Predicted volume. I didn't put um, like specific figures there, but uh, if you want to open an, an account and uh, fill the client data form, then you know the predict predicted volume has to make sense and it has to be easy to evaluate. So uh, I don't know if if the company or the entrepreneur sells their time for a specific amount of money, let's say. 100 euros per hour and you work for 100 uh, hours per month then you can't make more than 10,000 euros if if you start like randomly getting uh, hundreds and thousands of euros or if you predict that the volume is going to be this then um, it's um, you know sketchy and why I wrote the impossible is that uh, you know if the Predicted volumes don't match with the uh, industry at all. Yep. And connection to Estonia, I pretty much mentioned actually. If the connection is strong, if the most partners are in Estonia or workers or um, or the B, not the BO, but uh, let's say um, board members are in Estonia, then that's a connection to Estonia. Sometimes people think that if they, you know, hire a consultancy firm or a book, bookkeeping company from Estonia, then hey, we have partners. No, it actually has to be the supply chain. Let's establish that. And we don't open companies for, we don't open accounts for companies that uh, don't have any connection to Estonia. Yep. So the account opening process, as I mentioned before, the first step is client data form can be submitted online or in, in any of our branches. I mean, um, it, it, it might be useful to start from actually coming to the office and filling the client data form there because the face-to-face -face identification is required anyway. But uh, to get the pre-decision, you can also apply online and all the due diligence, due diligence and uh, decision process can be da done before you come to the office. Uh, Client data form or filling out the client data form takes about 15 minutes, not more. Uh, decision process. Uh, firstly, uh, what is done is uh, the background check, um, checking the public, publicly known information and the information that you have provided. Of course, documents, uh, uh, personal ID and uh, a company's documents from the business registry, first of all, then the risk assessment is done on the background and the risk assessment, or now, now I'm actually letting into to our, um, I'm letting you in, in into our internal processes, uh, risk assessment actually um, dictates the due diligence measures that we need to apply. So whether you are considered low risk, medium risk or high risk. Uh, then we are going to send inquiries to you. So that means the collaboration with you um, via email and internal processing. And this internal processing is also dictated uh, by the risk assessment, meaning that uh, there might be several people who are actually overlooking your client data form or your applica application. Yeah. And the whole internal process or the process of uh, decision can take from one day. So you can actually get the bank account on the same day sometimes uh, up to three weeks. Yep. And signing documents can be done online 
if you came to the office to fill the client data form uh, in the first place, it means you're already identified or in any of our branches, and it takes up to 15 minutes. But uh, if you are a startup and you don't have established a company yet, then that can be done on the company registration portal in our in Estonian business registry. And uh, you can make the initial, um, initial share capital uh, payment via that portal as well. But I actually, <laughs> I, I, I know that the e-residency team um, maybe don't agree with me, but I person, uh, personally uh, suggest that uh, for e-residents, it's maybe wiser to uh, establish a company without actually paying the, the share capital right away. Because if you have deposited money on the account and they're, I don't know, you don't, uh, match with the uh, risk appetite or your company's activities don't match with our risk appetite then you know getting it out of this deposit uh, it's a hustle as well yep and the price list for e-residents e or non-residents uh, account opening starts from 200 euros can be up to actually can be up to 500 uh, if you are not from the european economy uh, area um, monthly fees are 20 euros from 20 euros to 100 euros so there's actually like uh, it's 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 like two step so it's either 20 or 100 corporate plan is free Cor you know, um, on the corporate plan you can uh, make unlimited free uh, euro payments have one free debit card without monthly fee fee uh, deposit cash in co-op stores we're integrated with uh, co-op stores that uh, I know that several of, several of you have in your countries as well. And if you join us before August uh, 31st, then you can do it for free if you use the code ER200. Yep. Thanks. Good deal. Very good deal. And just uh, just before, um, Kat, I hand over to you, I should say that we will be um, putting a recording of this on YouTube. So don't worry if, uh, don't like be worrying too much about writing notes and everything because we'll, we'll, and we'll also put a copy of these slides on our website and you'll get a link to that uh, page tomorrow. Uh, so um, sit back and relax and, 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 and enjoy the content. All right, um, moving on to LAV and, uh, and also uh, the customer segments we welcome. I have also been uh, putting together um, a kind of matrix uh, so you could use it as a tool for self evaluation um, using the, the green, uh, yellow, red light, um, light system. Green there being something that usually gets approved, red on the contrary. Um, Reject it, and then yellow everything that uh, falls in between those two. However, um, I would have to start by admitting that there, there really is no green area with uh, with when it comes to e residents, um, and the reason behind it is uh, that uh, there is almost no condition that would automatically get an approval, other than being an Estonian resident and, uh, and, uh, and a citizen, and in which case we would be legally obligated to offer uh, financial services too. Um, but on the other hand, it's also good news. There's uh, not much we say automatically no to <laughs> without having had a look at, and, uh, and we really do approach every client, each application personally, analyze each business case by case, and, uh, and then make a decision based on that. Um, I have brought out a few criteria that more often than not get rejected, but um, there are also many exceptions to these. So perhaps it's easier if um, if we go through the criteria that fall in the red category uh, for us, and then I'll explain these in a bit more detail. And in case you don't recognize yourself <laughs> uh, in, in in there, then you can count yourself as uh, as yellow and and therefore uh, free to apply. Um, yeah, so let's uh, first look at this industry-wise. 
we're not usually comfortable with uh, gaming or gambling, uh, betting, esports companies. Does not mean we don't have them, we do. Um, but in most cases, they are quite well established names and, uh, and uh, one man startup ideas are not something uh, that usually would, would uh, get an approval in this case. Um, by default, also not accepting adult content providers, crypto related businesses, NFT related businesses. Again, we have onboarded quite a few. Um, also, the reason why maintaining good correspondent relationships is something very close to, <laughs> close to us and, uh, and uh, we keep an eye on. Um, but today we have um, uh, a, a different branch for this, our UK banking services branch. We have, um, we have kind of um, outsourced our clients there. And uh, this branch there is, is, in essence, it's a fintech oriented. Um, so, so uh, we here in Estonia, we don't really um, onboard um, much of those, uh, as well as for payment service providers, virtual asset providers, any of those either. Um, all other fields of activities, there's something that we are more than happy to consider. Impossible, as Marco said, to name all of them. Um, but just um, to go through the concept of digital nomads, what we usually do feel comfortable with. Um, someone whose business is not dependent on, on a specific location, um, programming, application development, uh, subscription-based services, all those. Um, however, we feel comfortable with digital nomads. It's still very important, as Ulana and as Markus pointed out, it's super important to have that connection to Estonia, even though the, uh, the business itself might be might not be um, location specific, uh, but we still uh, are looking for that connection to Estonia for for it to be a desirable uh, client for us. And I'm going to come back to the connection to Estonia later on as well in the matrix. Uh, yes, country of business. Um, European countries and the UK are quite easy for us. The FATF and offshore countries are something that uh, we more often than not say no to uh, or that get rejected without a very good business case. Uh, Russian, Belarusian businesses are off the table for now. Uh, European risk countries such as Malta, Cyprus, Luxembourg are also something that we are very cautious about. And uh, exactly all the same goes to beneficial owners as well. Same background requirements, basically. Um, if the residence or citizenship falls into any of these categories, it's highly likely the application will not be approved. Or if it is, then it's, uh, it'll be a longer process, more documentation. A very good business case would only justify it. Um, what we do like about the beneficial owners is when we have a proper CV uh, that supports the company's field of activity. Um, the representatives are open for discussion, for collaboration, willing to prove, willing to explain uh, origin of funds, as Marcus um, so thoroughly described. Uh, it'll also help if the company has a portfolio already, where, or a web page where we could see the examples of uh, previous works or anything basically that would in general help us get a better idea of, uh, of the business. Um, and service-wise, um, there are basically two services we do not offer to our clients that they are payment gateway and nominee account services. All other, I feel comfortable saying that we have them starting from everyday banking, um, acquiring services, e-commerce, um, and also, as Marcus pointed out, if you're in, interested in investments, LHV is your partner you want to be doing business with in that area in Estonia. Um, and connection to Estonia, the, the most important question EU residents are, are facing, what is considered as a strong connection in Estonia. Um, as it's been said previously, simply having the, the plastic card does not give you a residency or, or a strong uh, connection enough to apply for an account. But, uh, but what we do see as a strong connection is having an office here in Estonia or targeting your services to Estonia. 
um, having uh, partners here, having clients here, um, maybe own a warehouse, have a production here, um, investments as well, be it uh, real estate, be it uh, stocks, bonds, everything this is included. Having a connection, having none of the above would most likely not be accepted. And uh, moving on to, to how do you apply? Changing the slides. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So say if there is a connection and, uh, and you wish to apply for the account, how do you do that? Um, walking through the steps. First thing you want to do, just uh, before we go in there, the, the process is more or less very similar to what Co-op has, has uh, in place and what Marcus has already been introducing you. Um, so first of all, would be submitting the application online, uh, preferably. Uh, you can, the first two steps can be done, carried out in, the, um, in our client office as well. But it might be easier if you do it in advance and uh, if you don't get approved, then you would send yourself to the bank. Uh, but you can also do it in person here and get done with the face-to-face -face identification part um, as well. But ideally, uh, how I would recommend to start the, uh, the process is by submitting the application online. LHV.ee uh, non resident is where you can do it. Probably take you less than 15 minutes even. And on that same, um, same address, you will find the list of documents we, uh, we ask you to send us to non residents at LHV.ee, which is a completed PDF application form. Uh, passport copies of the board members and the beneficial owners, uh, all of the owners who hold over 25% of the companies, um, and an overview of the ownership structure in case it's something else than you owning the company 100%, in which case we should be able to get that information ourselves. Um, putting all that together, 30 minutes helps, I would guess. And then the third part, the longest one, is getting the actual approval, um, which today is, in more, most more complex cases, might take up to two to four weeks. But uh, again, if it's simply you yourself owning the company that's registered in Estonia, your business is clearly registered to Estonia, there's a solid background to support that, you'll probably get the approval in a week, maybe two. Um, and during that time, we'll then analyze your company, uh, your work done so far, people behind it, and um, and all the risks we might come across or might identify. Often enough, we reach out to clients, ask for additional explanations, additional documents, just to be on the safe side that all of our risk the risks have been minimized and um, everything has been taken into into account before making the final decision. And the fourth one, um, after getting the approval, then uh, is um, is face-to-face uh, -face identification. You might have done it earlier. Um, you can do it at any uh, part of the process, actually. Uh, and this um, this will give you flexibility uh, once you get the approval, uh, meaning that you'll be able will be able to sign the sign the agreements online. Uh, via email, uh, but if not, then it's fine. We'll simply ask you to come to the office. We have one in Tallinn, we have one in Tartu, and now Bernu as well, um, and uh, get that sorted in person. But bear in mind is that face-to-face -face identification, even though you can do it at any stage, um, this does not guarantee you an account. Uh, simply adds, adds flexibility to, let's say, when you have to be away, um, at the moment of getting the approval, then you would, wouldn't have to fly in uh, and we would get to the signing part uh, immediately and open the account in five minutes. And about the price list, again, quite similar to co-ops, I'd have to say, um, account opening fee being 200 euros, uh, monthly fee being 20 euros. Um, there's a free bank card uh, and uh, free, Deposit with withdrawal options. Uh, the bank card's monthly fee is two euros. 
We also offer free European payments within SAP region. Um, there's an online bank that comes with the account free of charge as well. And uh, as I mentioned, a very solid, convenient uh, investment services. Um, also offering you uh, buying, selling stocks in, in the Baltic uh, market free of charge and keeping them free as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop the slides now and we're going to go to the q and can. I've already had a look and there's some really, really great questions. So um, let's uh, start, start from um, the first one. I like to charge my customers in Bitcoin for my services. What banks are okay with cryptocurrencies? So maybe you guys can first uh, just reiterate uh, what you said about the crypto, the sort of the, the, the difference between a crypto company, but maybe also um, where you do allow some crypto um, uh, transactions. And then we can maybe also add um, what we know from the marketplace that there are some fintechs who do offer this. Okay, so uh, what we allow about crypto is that basically if you have, let's say, a holding company, uh, where you hold your personal assets um, or you do something entirely different and invest some of that into crypto, then that's fine. But actually accepting payments in crypto, that means that we don't know uh, part of your basically supply chain or can't tell where the money comes from because you, you, know, you can't directly pay in crypto to our bank account. Uh, it has to come from... Um, some sort of service provider or intermediary. Uh, so yeah, in that case, we would not be compliant with uh, due diligence measures, basically. Yeah, same goes to LHV. Um, you can buy cryptocurrencies. It's uh, very conveniently integrated into our online banking system, but um, but we don't accept them from someone else. Uh, so you can invest in them, uh, but but not accepting uh, payments from other people, um, not onboarding any crypto-related uh, companies in that sense at all. Uh, it has been done um, by our UK department, uh, payment service, uh, banking services, um, LHV, but just checked with them this morning they're not doing it and not accepting any new customers uh, regarding that. Uh, so maybe you will take it from here <laughs> and say what options do we have for, for those kind of uh, businesses. Yeah, so I guess that's, uh, so that's kind, of, kind of clear. There's, there's several several questions though about face-to-face, um, uh, -face, uh, you know, bank account uh, opening. And I think this is what we've covered quite extensively is that you do need to, at some point in time, visit the bank office for uh, uh, real life authentication of your, of your identity, basically. So, so like, it doesn't matter what kind of a company you are, it's just like there's one visit to the bank that is required. Um, but, but in saying that, as, we, as Ulene covered in the slides, um, there are options to open bank, business bank accounts with some of the fintechs totally online. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't need to come to Estonia um, if, if you were to open those accounts. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know that there was like a little bit down the, down the line, there was a few questions about like, what, what is the like, reason to have a real bank account versus a fintech? And there's, there's essentially two big um, differences. Uh, uh, in the bank, your deposits are protected um although fintechs have to keep their customers money and their own money separately as well um but banks give out business loans or like any kind of loans and fintechs do not so these are the these are the main differences um and i know for some of the companies in certain sectors it's very important to have a bank account starting with the iban letters over the over the country where their business is registered uh, due to various reasons so if that is the case you still have the option of turning to one of those banks here or going to one of the fintechs that just uh, do offer an ee bank account so you still have the option of fintech so, Kat, um, on the investing, um, uh, someone's asking, we want to get access to the NASDAQ Baltic, um, and, and they're asking specifically, can LHV be helpful in such a case? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, if, if we're just talking about 
buying and selling shares from the OMX Nasdaq, then yes, something you can do for free. <laughs> hey, um, so someone's asking, someone's saying that they've set up a WISE account, a business account with WISE, um, but they weren't able to open one with an Estonian account. So something that we, the e-residency team, often recommend for um, entrepreneur, e -res entrepreneurs is that you start with a fintech in the first year or two years of business. You show, grow, show solid record. You show your solid record as both um, Marcus and Kat said, you know, then you can give your documents, you can have a payment history, you can show that you've, you know, your consistent transactions um, and you can also build connections um, with business partners in Estonia using the WISE account or the Payhawk or Integer or whatever it is. And then it's more likely that you will be able to open an account with one of the, the banks because you can have, you have that track record. So I think like, Keep going with WISE because they really are very good and, um, and, uh, and, and get that track record and then apply again to an Estonian bank when you're, when you're ready. Okay. So Russian e-residents. That's a, that's a, I guess a cover topic today as well. Um, what about what about a, a company that's got two Spanish e-residents and a Russian uh, e-resident as co-founders? Is there any hope for them in any any of the banks? Mm -hmm. What's the percentage of ownership? I would have to ask. Yes. Okay, we don't know this from the comment or the question, but <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. yes, like le legally speaking, uh, beneficial owner is somebody who owns 25% plus one vote basically in the company. Mm -hmm. If it's less than, um, then they're not legally speaking uh, beneficial sure. owners. Yeah. Um, someone's asking if they move countries. So, um, if, you know, if they're resident of one country when they open a bank account, um, and then they move countries. Will co-op in this case keep their business bank account going? Does the uh, if the residency of the of the shareholder changes? Well, of course, it uh, depends on on Sorry. on different aspects. Whether that uh, if if the business is still related to Estonia as it was before, I I, I, I think then probably we will we would keep the account. Yeah. Another, another, I guess, uh, complicated question is an I Iranian um, a citizen, but if they are a resident of another country, such as Ukraine, in this uh, question, and somebody who already has accounts in Austria and Ukraine, would, would, would they be considered completely off limits as a, as a blacklisted country that Iran is as by their citizenship? Or does residency in another country add some points uh, in terms of opening a business account? Uh, I would say yes, definitely worth into, worth looking into. Um, residence is something we do consider uh, for sure. Again, yes, if there's nothing negative at the background, it might get moved. Mm -hmm. Yep, I I agree. Go off again. Okay. Uh, but a personal bank account. Mm. So, like, we want to um, influence or emphasize once more that, like, we are strictly speaking here about business accounts for your companies in Estonia. So, as for personal accounts, we do not cover this topic today at all. So, if you have a question about opening a personal bank account, go. <laughs> This is this 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 webinar is not about that today. Payhawk. Yeah, Payhawk does uh, does provide Estonian IBAN. Um, that is very interesting that you have this kind of an info, because when we onboarded them, we knew that they are indeed offering uh, uh, an EE IBAN. So this is this is something that we're we're gonna have to look into. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Carlos, um, I think, so for co-op, it would be better if clients started with WISE and then after one year. I, yeah, as, as I said before, this is something that we do recommend. Um, get get that history, the payment history, the transactions, the, the connection to Estonia strong, and then um, you're much more likely to successfully open an Estonian bank account. Mm-hmm. And there was a couple of more questions about like what the connection really means, and I believe that we covered this this today quite well. So part of the supply chain, either the clients or suppliers need to be in Estonia, office, employees, what else, the shareholders, um, to correct me if I missed something. Yep, that's that's correct. Real estate? Does real estate count? Might account, yes. Mm-hmm. So someone's um, saying they supply, um, they they pay their suppliers on the Alibaba platform in China with a debit card, and they're asking about limits. So currently, I think they have Wise, but I suppose, um, and and I'm not exactly sure what the limits are with Wise, but maybe um, this is a this is an interesting topic. Are there any limits to um, to using the cards uh, in the business bank accounts for Co-op and LHB, or what the maximum limits are to 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 use in a in a web platform to pay your suppliers. Hmm. I'm assuming the question is in the, like for the reason that there are big amounts of, of money going out basically on a monthly basis. I mean, I know. Yeah, if- I, Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, actually, I would say that um, ten thousand a day. I'm actually fact checking right now, so maybe if you know answer for LHV. Uh, I mean, we don't it. really have um, uh, a sense of specific limit to to that. If it all makes sense and it's um, it's been previously approved, uh, if it's justified by uh, the the business, the the um, yeah, I wouldn't say we have a limit for for that. We just need to look into that and uh, make a decision based by the client. Yeah, essentially, you yourself uh, decide what limits your card has because it's uh, security of your own money, basically. Mm-hmm. There are yes limits that you can set yourself, but up, uh, mm-hmm. starting from a certain certain um, yeah, amount, it would need to get an additional approval by different levels inside the bank. So we have a really good question here. So if there are multiple founders of a company. Do they all need to be there in person to open the business account, or is it can it just be like the one managing partner, for example? Yeah, well, uh, the face-to-face identification has on, only has to be carried out only by the director of the company who okay. wants to have access to the account. Um, we don't need to identify the owners face-to-face. We would need to get the passport copies, uh, but coming in in person would only have to be done uh, by the by the signatory person. Yeah, definitely not not all, but uh, all the ones, as Kurt said, that are going to use the account. Mm-hmm. So Tim is asking: Is there any chance of being able to work with a local UK bank now that we are no longer in the EU? Um, I, I don't think Britain has joined the EEA, um, and so in and in the Estonian Commercial Code, I'm pretty sure it's quite specific that it's the European Economic Area. Um, but this is something actually that maybe we should check because um, maybe there has been agreements. I'm not sure that would allow it. Um, but basically, the main reason that uh, we sort of limit it to the EEA is for the minimum share capital requirement. So if you want to be able to register your minimum share capital in your bank account for your business in Estonia, um, that needs to be in a, in a fintech or, or a traditional bank in the EEA area. So um, this, let, let's take this one as a, as a comment and, and maybe we can, um, we can get back to you, Tim. UK ceased to be a contracting party to the EEA agreement after its withdrawal from the EU on 31st of January 2020. Okay, so that sounds pretty clear to me. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tim. <laughs> Question for Marcus specifically. Mm. Swiss seeking a banking relationship for traditional physical commodities trading, primary and secondary metals, uh, 
I can't even pronounce this, ferrous and non-ferrous trading on global scale. Can I um, apply with you or should I go to uh, Zug? Is that a fintech? Zug, Zug is, a, is a canton of Switzerland. Oh. Yeah, so it's, a, it's the, low, the low tax canton of Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always apply. I mean, uh, it, it doesn't hurt. As I mentioned before, uh, during the presentation on the process of opening the account and uh, filling out the client data form takes 15 minutes and we will look into it. Okay. Um, if I'm a single person company living as a digital nomad, but I rent an actual office in Estonia, I have a contract on a yearly basis with an Estonian accountant and I have clients all over the world, while living anywhere in the world, would this be considered a strong enough connection to Estonia? Yeah, that's the exact um, example that I uh, that I brought before. That uh, it has to be, you know, part of supply chain. So just by so having an empty office does not count. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But we see that quite a lot. For right. that, uh, I uh, I assume it's for the same reason to actually have have the Estonian IBAN in Estonian bank, but. Uh, Unfortunately, it doesn't work for us. Okay, so um, we've actually run out of time. I'm really sorry, um, but there are a few uh, final things. Firstly, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Marcus and Kat and Lenny for joining me. Um, if uh, For those of you who registered and attended, you will be getting tomorrow an email um, uh, with a link to this webpage here. Um, we'd really appreciate if you went there and you filled out the survey um, that will also pop up on your screen after you leave the Zoom here. You can get to know more of our resources online on our web and you can also join us at upcoming events. We're starting to have a lot more events in person now, which is great, not just in Estonia, but um, in various parts of the world. So look out for those on our events calendar on our uh, website. You can, <coughs> excuse me, you can also subscribe to our newsletter if you're not already subscribed. Um, Engage with us on social media. We're, that we're real people behind social media. So we will, if you have questions, you can always, always ask us there. Um, the best place though to ask uh, any additional questions you might have, or if you don't think that you had a question that was answered today, is to write to our support channel, e-resident at gov.ee. Um, finally, just before we go, um, uh, just a reminder to any Ukrainians in the audience that we're currently running a campaign where we're reimbursing e-residency fees for Ukrainians. Um, so that means that the e-residency program is, is covering the state fee for applying for e-residency and uh, about nine service providers on our marketplace are covering the fee to register the company. So um, you can find all details about this on, um, again, on our website and on the website of many of the, the service providers as well. Um, but this might just be a good help for you um, starting a business at the moment in difficult times. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you uh, guys for being here. Um, it's been and a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure.